welcome speakers from Juniper. Aniket Daptari, Senior Product Manager, Cloud Network Automation, Contrail, Juniper Network. Vivekanand Chenoy, Cloud Network Virtualization Solution Architect at Juniper Networks. And uh, Raj Gopalan, Shiv Ramakrishnan, Open Contrail, Juniper Networks, Distinguished Software Engineer. Can you hear me? Okay, perfect. It's a great lineup of speakers, and uh, we'd like to include in that. Uh, we, we are happy that uh, we are included in this great lineup. So thanks to the organizers, and thank you all of you for uh, attending. It's being shown, right? So what we are uh, so we represent uh, Juniper Networks, and what we are here to talk about is uh, Open Contrail. Now, Open Contrail is this um, software solution for network virtualization, and in, in in many ways, it's it's solving the 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 problems it is solving is very similar to what Andromeda does in Google's public cloud. And towards the end of their presentation, I asked them the question whether I can take Andromeda and run it on premise. It's, it's perfect that you can run Andromeda in their public cloud, but most often people will have some on premise private cloud, right? And so it would be ideal if I'm using Google's public cloud that I'm able to run the same kind of networking on premise as well. And what they explained to us is that Andromeda is not quite designed to be run on premise. And that's exactly uh, the problem that we can alleviate. So if you take Open Contrail, you can run Open Contrail both in your on-premise private cloud as well as in public cloud, regardless of which public cloud it is. So what that allows you to do is it, it builds an efficient on-ramp and off-ramp from the public clouds between the public and private clouds. Okay. So that's very important. Uh, it's very important to realize that all these public clouds have provided a, a, a large suite of uh, tools and technologies. But if you write to those tools and technologies, what, what ends up happening is you are confining yourself more and more to that environment. And once you check into that um, Hotel California, it's very hard to check out. OK? So, that's something that Open Contrail uh, addresses really well. So we, we do that by providing our own take on network virtualization. And then what we, what we are here to discuss about is um, why is there a need for performance enhancement in our solution, and what is our approach to uh, performance enhancement? I'll just give some general background about Contrail. So, so Contrail was um, a startup that Juniper acquired sometime in 2012. And when Juniper acquired them, there was a wave of acquisitions. Um, VMware acquired this company called Nicira. Cisco acquired this company called Insiemi Networks. Uh, Alcatel Lucent acquired this company called Nuage Systems, or Nuage Networks. And Juniper acquired this company called Contrail Systems. And all these companies, and there were a, a few other startups that continue to exist, independent, uh, et cetera. And all these companies were um, trying to solve network virtualization or software-defined networking and had their own take. And Contrail was a, an acquisition in a similar space. And the founders of Contrail, the people who started the company Contrail, they had spent some time first at Juniper building uh, our first line of switches. And in, even before that, they had uh, written some of our uh, very foundational building blocks like BGP, MPLS, et cetera, IPVPNs, et cetera. And then when they went on to spend some time at other places like Facebook, Google, Amazon, uh, they, they were solving cluster management problems at those other places, their other uh, jobs. And what they realized, some of the founding members, what they realized was that these foundational technologies, foundational networking building blocks like BGP, MPLS, and IPVPNs, they are very suitable 
to also solve problems of cluster management first within the confines of the data center and then by virtue of those technologies by the by virtue of the nature of those technologies you can extend those even beyond the data center that's exactly the point i made at the beginning of uh, of this talk that you can seamlessly extend your network infrastructure beyond your on premise data center across the van all the way to the public cloud public cloud or to other uh, uh, other data centers that you might have so um continue a little bit further and give some more background that doesn't really need any slides so what's what's the problem that really um network virtualization is solving let's talk about the problem first so we understand why you need network virtualization in the first place the the, the problem is that when you take when you take uh, cloud based data centers which are uh, which may have a, a a large chunk of virtualized assets what virtualization does is that it 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 allows people to manage compute and storage as one large pool one large chunk rather than managing compute and storage on a box by box basis now in such an environment the the consumption of infrastructure is uh, automated self service and therefore the consumers of infrastructure become tenants of uh, infrastructure become tenants of the cloud data center and so what ends up happening is what you will see in one of the one of the slides is that infrastructure is shared across tenants what that means is tenants their applications or their workloads run on these um, shared infrastructure and so workloads from a tenant coke and a tenant pepsi could be sitting and running alongside each other on the same piece of shared infrastructure at the same time what could also happen is that workloads from a single tenant could be launched could be spawned on various computes that may be across different racks within the same data center or that could be running in multiple different data centers or they could be running um, uh, in the public as well as the private cloud so the network for that tenant needs to extend to wherever that tenant's workloads are present so these two problems need to be solved and how did we solve these problems we had already virtualized compute and storage but did we virtualize the network the answer is we did virtualize the network we used legacy network virtualization we used vlans virtual local area networks vlans legacy approach to network virtualization in this when when you use this legacy approach to network virtualization when a new tenant comes in you have to carve out a vlan for that new tenant and that new vlan carving out that new vlan itself is a very um, cumbersome process you have to go through ticketing and change management and several layers of approval and then you identify a vlan to be uh, allocated to that tenant then that vlan has to be configured in every top of rack switch because that tenant workloads could be launched anywhere in this cloud based data center right then associated with this tenant are a bunch of acls or security policies those two have to be configured in every top of rack switch because that tenant workloads could be launched anywhere so what you are doing is you are storing a lot of state associated with tenants in your physical infrastructure in your switches and when you are configuring switches you have to you know make this configuration so you have to go through commits and when the tenant goes away all that state corresponding to the tenant has to be taken away so you are doing commits and roll back um back and forth so there's a lot of churn in your physical infrastructure um so there were there were many other challenges associated with using legacy network virtualization with with vlans you have to run things like spanning tree to avoid loops and in cloud based data centers you want all the bandwidth that's available to you you want every bit of bandwidth that's available to you not thrown away links because you want to avoid loops uh further with vlans you are confined to 4095 number of tenants and in cloud based data centers you, there are far too many tenants far greater than 4095 so all these were challenges associated with using legacy network virtualization and we needed a new approach to network virtualization so we'll see we, we, when the slide comes up we'll see what our approach to network virtualization was okay so this slide is going to explain what was our approach to network virtualization 
I, I just explained what was what were some of the issues associated with legacy network virtualization. So what you see here in this picture, um, visualize a cloud-based data center where you have racks and racks of x86 compute, and on these uh, racks and racks of x86 compute, you have some virtualized workloads running from different tenants. So what you see on, so there are two representative computes here, and they are interconnected with a physical IP fabric. What is the physical IP fabric? It's the layer of top of rack switches, which in turn are connected with a layer of spine switches. Um, on purpose, I've, I've, I've represented that as a cloud because in the context of this solution, um, what here, in what architecture you interconnect them, what model you interconnect them, all of that becomes, uh, we are completely agnostic to that and it's completely transparent to the physical IP fabric being used. The only thing we expect from that IP fabric is IP reachability from any server to any other server. Okay, now let's, let's focus on what the problem is. If you look at these representative servers here, what you see is there are workloads from tenant Coke sitting alongside workloads from tenant Pepsi. That's point number one. And point number two is tenant Pepsi has workloads sitting on this host as well as on this other host that may potentially be in a different rack. So two things need to happen from the point of view of networking. One is I need to make sure, networking needs to make sure that anything that tenant Pepsi does, the Pep tenant Pepsi's workload does, the, in no way, shape, or form affects tenant Coke's workload. That's point number one. And point number two is tenant Pepsi's network needs to extend to wherever tenant Pepsi's workloads are present. Okay? So to solve this, uh, our approach to network in the legacy world, we created VLANs and we had to configure ACLs in your switches. Our approach is that the controller is going to create um, VRFs corresponding to each tenant. VRFs, if you're not familiar, are virtual route forwarding instances. In some sense, they are namespaces for networking. So they isolate the networking domain for each tenant. So the controller is going to instruct the vRouter to create a VRF for the tenant Pepsi and create a separate VRF for the tenant Coke. That way, you're isolating the two tenants and you're providing secure tenant isolation. What about extending the network to wherever that tenant's workloads are present? In order to extend networks, the best technology we all are familiar with are IPVPNs. IPVPNs, uh, so when we want to connect to our corporate network from our homes, we log on to the corporate VPN. So that's exactly what we are going to do here. Uh, when, the, when the controller finds out that tenant Pepsi's workloads are present on more than one host, it's going to instruct the vRouter on all those hosts to establish a corresponding VPN for that tenant. Okay, so, so therefore the, the value that Contrail is bringing in this solution is that it creates these VRFs, populates those VRFs with the necessary routes, it establishes these VPNs, and whenever security policies are required, those will get configured and enforced on this, uh, this entity called the vRouter um, uh, on an as-needed basis. So, and, and all of these constructs are completely automated and um, both the tenant as well as the administrator are completely, don't have to configure or touch a single switch. All of this is done and maintained in software on the server and not a single switch or a single line of config on the switch needs to change. So that's the value. So what are the components of this solution? There are two components. There's a control plane component called the controller, and then there is a distributed forwarding plane component called as the vRouter. So a lot of the value is coming from this component called the vRouter. And this vRouter is sitting as a kernel module on every host. And so what does this vRouter do? This vRouter, it receives packets that arrives on the NIC, and then, um, or let's say when VMs originate packets, the packets originated by these VMs that need to be sent out on the physical NIC, they, they first get intercepted by the vRouter, and then the vRouter is going to put these packets on VPN tunnels. What that means is it's going to put on some encapsulation, and on the other end of the tunnel, it's going to perform decapsulation. Further, it's also going to um, apply some security policies, enforce ACLs. So, in our, so it's doing all of this while it is sitting in the, inside the kernel. And obviously when it's doing all of this, 
sitting in the kernel, it's incurring some performance penalties. Putting on this end cap, taking off this end cap, uh, uh, decapsulating those packets, and then uh, applying security policies. All of this is incurring some performance overhead. Now, um, in the context of network virtualization, uh, there is this aspect called a service chaining. And we'll, we'll see what service chaining is. But uh, this slide introduces what network virtualization, what is our approach to network virtualization. And because this V router is sitting in the kernel, it incurs that performance penalty that needs to be alleviated. Now, now the next slide, we'll focus on why in the context of NFV that becomes especially important. Yes. On... No. Uh, the, the, the person who owns the infrastructure, they will run some uh, tooling that will install the vRouter on every host. The tooling is provided by us. We provide this solution, and we provide the tooling that will install the necessary components in the necessary boxes. Let's take uh, a simple example. Let's take Google's public cloud. Google owns the infrastructure. They own the box. They own the operating system that runs on the box and everything that runs on that operating system. If you are a tenant of that public cloud, what you rent from Google are VMs that run on that box on top of the host operating system. Okay? So this box that I'm showing is the box that is owned by the, the cloud provider. And it could be the case even in the case of on-premise cloud. In the case of on-premise cloud, the IT organization owns this cloud, owns the infrastructure, and has control over what host OS is installed. And tenants, even within pr private clouds, are going to bring in their VMs. Okay? So therefore, the cloud provider has control over what software gets installed. The cloud provider gets the tooling from us. And the tooling is going to make sure that these components are installed. So this slide explains um, why there is need for performance enhancement. The next slide we'll talk about. So there's a question on the bridge. Why don't we take questions a little bit later? Yeah. Sure. Well, next slide, yes. So this slide quickly uh, drives home the point that infrastructure is not always 100% virtualized. When infrastructure is a, is a mixed environment, you have some bare metal servers, some applications that cannot be virtualized continue to run on bare metal server hardware. And then on the other end of the spectrum, you have applications that you uh, start deploying inside of containers. So what you need from the underlying network infrastructure is same set of network primitives regardless of how you are deploying your applications. And that is something that Contrail can provide, but because that's not the topic of this, uh, of this uh, conversation, we'll just pass forward. But essentially, that's the logical picture that uh, this allows you to, uh, to accomplish. The logical picture says there is a network segment where there are some VMs and bare metal servers hanging off of the same network segment. Interconnected via some network functions, like a firewall, to other similar network segments where you have a uh, diverse set of workloads hanging from the same network segment. And it's pretty powerful, but it's a, it's a topic for a discussion some other time. Next slide. So this is where I'm going to explain what service chaining is. But to explain that, I'll quickly explain what is what um, the fundamental unit of network virtualization is this uh, entity called as a virtual network. And what is a virtual network? It's a closed user group, and all members of this closed user group are considered trusted peers of each other. And any communication within the members of that closed user group is permitted by default. And any communication that needs to cross the boundaries of a, of a virtual network is governed by specific explicit policy. In the absence of explicit policy, communication that needs to cross the boundaries of a virtual network will not be permitted. So these are some of the ground rules of uh, network virtualization as we, as we implement it. So what you see in the top half is the view that an application developer wants to see instantiated. 
So the application developer is deploying a, um, you know, a popular three-tier web application. So it has a web front end, a caching middle tier, a database back end. So what the application developer wants from the infrastructure without worrying about how it gets implemented is that each app tier is isolated in a segment of its own. So the green network corresponds to the front end, the blue network corresponds to the caching tier, and the yellow network corresponds to the database tier. Now it's a web application, so I want to make sure that the web front end does not communicate straight to the database. It al always should go through the caching tier, and, and uh, to the caching tier, only HTTP traffic should be permitted. It's, an HTT it's a web application, so I don't want to permit any other kind of traffic. And if there is a cache miss and traffic needs to hit the database, then I want to make sure it gets sent through a firewall. So this is what uh, the application developer wants to see instantiated. How it gets uh, implemented in the physical world is this diagram. Um, so we'll skip to this part where, it, where the, the, the developer has specified a workflow that if traffic needs to hit the database, I want to make sure it goes through a firewall. Now, the caching VM, the database VM, and the firewall VM, they're all VMs, and they could be sitting on three completely different hosts. But it's the job of the controller and the V router to make sure that that uh, path is actually adhered to, that path is actually followed. So uh, when, um, let's say B2, it, it constructs a packet with source equal to B2 and destination equal to Y3 and sends that packet out. The V router, it's the default gateway for all that traffic, so it receives such a packet. And because this policy exists, it will already have been configured with a route that says if source is blue and destination is yellow, then the next hop is actually the firewall VM's uh, interface. So this automated programming of the next hops to make this sequence of network functions that path actually follow, that's actually uh, the notion of service chaining. So in these cases, traffic has to be sent through these network functions. And what network functions do is they take packets, and then they have to act on these packets. So uh, therefore, the aspect of packets per second is extremely important for them. And when the vRouter sits as a kernel module, it's incurring some performance penalties, and that needs to be alleviate, alleviated. Now, the vRouter, it actually receives packets. It acts on them, it performs end cap, d cap, and then hands those packets to the user space uh, VMs. So that's why it becomes especially interesting if you want to use technologies such as DPDK. So with that, I'd like to um, you know, invite Raja, uh, my senior colleague, to explain how we have implemented DPDK, how we've leveraged DPDK. So uh, just to add, Raja is also one of the Intel software innovators. We are honored to have him. Can you hear me? So my name is Raja Sivram Krishnan. I'm a software engineer at Juniper Networks. So as Aniket mentioned, Contrail is a network virtualization product, so it allows you to create virtual networks. And you can, um, you can do this without having to configure the physical infrastructure in any way. So you can provision new tenants, new applications, without configuring VLANs, security policies on the switches, um, nothing on the servers, things like that. And the way we do that is using uh, overlay networking. So from the, from the compute servers, we have overlay tunnels to other servers, and we support MPLS over GRE, MPLS over UDP, VXLAN. And one of our goals was that we didn't want to invent any new protocols or new encapsulations. So our goal was to make it uh, everything based on standards, and that's why we picked um, MPLS over GRE, which is popularly used in L3GPN. So one of the important objectives for us was to ensure that there's no additional performance penalties as a result of using the overlay. So what I'll talk about today is where we started and what were the changes that we have made 
um, from the time we started, which was about four years ago. So at the beginning, we had a kernel module. So we have the V router, which is the um, virtual router, which runs inside the host kernel on the servers. And on every server, we have a user space agent. So that is the uh, vRouter host agent. And the vRouter agent is responsible for programming the forwarding plane. So things like interfaces, routes, next hops, flows, those are added by the vRouter agent into vRouter. And it does that using, using Netlink system calls. There's also a Nova agent, which is the OpenStack component that runs on the compute node and it's responsible for spawning and uh, deleting VMs as necessary. Inside the, inside the VMs themselves, we have standard Vertio front-end drivers, and packets to and from the VMs are handled by the vhost process, which is um, standard um, in Linux. And then it uses the, tap, uses the tap interfaces to send packets to vRouters, and also in the other direction. So the vRouter, when it's installed on, on a compute server, it takes over the physical interface. So every packet that comes in on the physical interface is handled by vRouter. Now this may be an, an overlay packet or it may not be an overlay packet. If it is an overlay packet, then vRouter looks at the MPLS label in the packet. And depending on what the label is, it decides which VM needs to see that packet. And if it's not an overlay packet, then it sends it to the host Linux um, networking stack. So when we started off, our throughput numbers were pretty low. So on a 10 gig link, we get about one gigabit per second. And then we made some changes. So for example, the vhost process that you see there, we could not use it because it only worked with Linux Bridge and OVS. So we had to make some changes to libvirt to enable the use of vhost net with ethernet type interfaces. And we also made vRouter use receive packet steering inside the Linux kernel. So that allows multiple CPU cores to be used to process packets. And we also enabled TCP segmentation and receive offload. So inside vRouter, uh, we coalesce multiple packets that arrive on the network. So you can have 1,500 byte TCP segments arriving on the wire inside an overlay tunnel. vRouter coalesces those packets into a large segment, and then it sends it to the VM. And similarly, the other direction, the VM can send a large 64K segment to vRouter. And then vRouter segments that in software, adds the, adds the overlay header out on the wire. And we had to do it in software because although some NICs are capable of doing TCP segmentation, not, not many NICs can do it with overlays. And even that with MPLS, there are very few NICs that, that can do it. So we had to do it in software. But the benefit of doing that is that the number of VM exits, the transitions from guest to host, are, are reduced by a lot. And that's what buys us the additional performance. So with those changes made, we, we are able to get line rate on a, on a 10 gig link, TCP throughput. And on a two by 10 gig lag, we get about 16 or 17 gigabits per second. So that is good for an application that, that terminates TCP connections, something like a web server. But if, if you're in an NFP scenario, the more important consideration is how many packets per second can we process. And with the kernel mode vRouter, what we find is that between two VMs running on different servers, we're not able to get more than 500,000 packets per second. That's the maximum we can do. And the reason for that is, is the VM exits, which are, which are very expensive. So every time you transition from a guest to the host, there's a huge overhead there. And because of that, you can only do half a million packets per second. So to address, address that problem, we chose to move to DPDK. So we'll, we'll take a look at that yeah. in the next slide. Thank you. Yeah, that's it. So this is a representation of vRouter running in user space when integrated with DPDK. So as you can see, there's no component inside the kernel anymore. And what used to run inside the kernel is now running in user space. So we have a process, which is the, the vRouter process here. And that process links with the DPDK library. It communicates with the vRouter host agent as before. But previously, it was Netlink system calls. But now we have a TCP connection from the vRouter agent to vRouter. And the Nova agent functions just as it used to before. And inside the guest, we can have a standard socket-based application 
or we can run a DPDK application inside the guest also. And we don't have TAP interfaces anymore. We use the vhost user functionality inside Kimu, which was added a couple of years back. So the entire address space of the VM is mapped into the address space of the vRouter process. So if vRouter chooses to read packets from the VM or send packets to the VM, it's a memory copy from, from vRouter to the VM. So with these changes, if, if the VM is running a DPDK application too, we are able to f process far more packets than, than we could before. So we've, been, we've measured upwards of 12 million packets per second between a pair of VMs, whereas previously it was half a million packets per second. But one of the issues we hit with this was that our TCP throughput numbers were actually lower than what we could get with the kernel v router. And the reason for that is the, the TCP segmentation offloads that I mentioned earlier, those are not available with the DPDK library. So with the kernel mode vRouter, we could coalesce multiple TCP segments into a large segment when sending them to the VM. And also in the other direction, we could get large segments from the VM. But that functionality is not available in the DPDK library. At least the APIs were not exposed. So when we first released vRouter with DPDK, although our packets per second numbers were much better, our TCP throughput was actually lower than what we could get with the kernel vRouter. And we have, we have now implemented those APIs inside DPDK. And we also had some um, collaboration with a few people from the DPDK team at Intel. So we might actually contribute that code back to, back to DPDK sometime later this year. So this slide goes into a little bit of detail inside the vRouter process itself. So as you can see, we have multiple L cores or logical cores. And each L core is responsible for handling one queue on, on the NIC. And it, it looks at the vRouter forwarding tables, which are, which are set up by the, um, by the vRouter agents over this TCP connection. That sets up the forwarding table. And we also have a thread which deals with setting up the memory maps that vRouter needs to copy packets to and from the VM. We also have a PKT0 interface, which is what vRouter uses to send packets to the, to the vRouter agent. So this would be things like the first packet of a flow, for example. We trap that to the agent. Or if the VM needs an address, it sends a DHCP request, we trap that to, be, to the vRouter agent. So those are done over the PKT0 interface. This is a brief packet walkthrough. So for a packet that's coming in on the wire, so it hits one of the CPU cores that vRouter is using. And this is configurable. How many cores vRouter uses is configurable when you provision the cluster. So in this case, let's say an MPLS over GRE packet came in on the wire. It hits CPU core zero. And with GRE, the NICs are not capable of sending the packets to multiple queues. So the, the core that gets the packet then does a hash on the inner packet, and it sends it to one of three other cores, one, two, or three. In this case, the packet is going from core zero to core, core one. And then core one does all the vRouter processing. So it decapsulates the packet, looks at the MPLS labels, decides which VM the packet needs to go to. And then it copies the packet into the VM. We also support multi-queue vertio. So inside, inside the VM, although this picture shows one queue, you could have multiple queues, and, and vRouter would, would pick one of the queues and send the packet to that queue based on the hash of the packet. <laughs> Can we go to next? So this is the packet in the opposite direction. So from the VM, again, you could have a single queue or multiple queues, depending on whether multi-queue or TIO is enabled. And a single queue is always handled by one CPU core inside vRouter to maintain packet order. And then it hashes the packet to other CPU cores so that we scale as we add more CPU cores to vRouter. And then in this case, packet is going from core three to core one. Core one does all of the vRouter processing. It encapsulates the packet, and then it sends it out on the wire. This is the 
performance that we see today. So like I mentioned, we could get line rate CCP throughput with the kernel vRouter, but it's only half a million packets per second. But with the DPDK vRouter, after we added the TCP offload, we were able to get line rate with um, DPDK vRouter too. And in addition to that, the, the packets per second number is, is much higher than what we could get before. So if, if the VM is itself not running a DPDK application, we do not see a, a significant improvement in performance, even if vRouter uses DPDK. So in order to get 12 million packets per, per second, for example, the VM should also use a DPDK application. Otherwise, the cost of the VM exits is still there, even if DPDK is used, if vRouter is using DPDK. And we support multi-queue VertIO both with the kernel vRouter and DPDK vRouter. And what we're doing right now is offloading the vRouter processing to a smart NIC. So with DPDK, although we get impressive numbers with uh, in terms of packets per second, it comes at the cost of CPU consumption. The so DPDK requires every CPU core to continuously poll for packets, and that chews up a lot of CPU <laughs> on the server. And ideally, the CPU is something that we would use to run network functions. So we do not, we do not, we do not want to dedicate cores just to poll for packets. And towards that end, what we've done now is to is to run vRouter on the NIC itself. So there are smart NICs which allow you to run vRouter on the NIC itself. And by doing that we now see in excess of 20 million packets per second without consuming any CPU on the host. Last thing I want to mention is that we are an open source project. So opencontrail.org is our website. We have a bunch of blogs there and our source code is also over there. We do not have a separate open source product and the commercial product. The open source version is the commercial version. So. I encourage all of you to go take a look at that, and yeah, if you have any feedback or comments, uh, please share them with us. Yeah, so the question is, um, TCP offload, is it offloaded to the NIC? No. Um, problem is with, with overlays, most NICs are not able to, able to do that. So if you have a TCP segment inside an overlay header, the NIC needs to parse the outer header and then get to the inner TCP packet before it can do the offload. So most NICs are not able to do that. With VXLAN, some, some NICs can do it, but with MPLS, it, um, we're not aware of any NICs that can do that. So as a result, we do it in software. It's, it's nothing on the NIC. What do you really mean by offload? So can you enumerate a bit on that? Yeah, sure. So if you did not have the offload, the VM would send let's say a 1500 byte segment, and that's what would go on the wire after you add the, the overlay header. So what the offload allows you to do is to let the VM send a large segment, and then vRouter breaks that down into smaller segments based on the MTU on the wire. And the reason that, that helps is because it reduces the number of VM exits between the VM and, and vRouter. Uh, how do you handle um, uh, L2 level with Contrail? Do you even bother about it or all the packet transfers are done at the network level? Yeah, we do support uh, EVPN too. So you can you can switch based on the MAC address within a virtual network. But you don't use uh, Linux Bridge or anything? You no, use... we don't use. So you can think of vRouter as sort of an alternative to using OVS or Linux. We have time. So a lot of companies use VXLAN for overlaying. So uh, why Contrail didn't choose VXLAN for overlay? So we also support VXLAN, but in addition to th addition to that, we also support MPLS because that's the standard technology used in L3 VPNs, and many service providers have already deployed L3 VPN. It's a sort of a natural extension to L3 VPN. But we do support VXLAN also. Thank you. OK, so we still have a demo, right? They're going to show a demo before. How to slide. Yes, continue. 
I have two slides. So uh, before I go to the, so I have a quick demo after this. So uh, before I go to the demo, I just want to like Aniket, I think already touched up. I just want to kind of explain a bit more in detail. So basically uh, uh, in Contrail, a virtual network is a closed group of users where you know any, any virtual machine or a container within a virtual network, they can talk to each other without any restrictions in terms of security. But by default, you know, we don't allow two networks to talk to each other. So. In that case, you can actually create a policy where you can connect two networks. But we, you know, kind of go a step beyond that, wherein you can connect. So, as you see in the first figure, we are connecting the network green and red. But at the same time, we are applying a chain of services. So, as you can see that the red is followed by a firewall, and then there is a DPI. So, anytime the two, any two virtual machines in these two networks, they want to talk to each other, so the traffic is actually sent to this service chain. And you know this is like there is nothing manual as Aniket kind of explained. You do it all. Uh, you do all of it at level. The VMs may be running in some you know some X host. The service functions they may be running on some other host. The contrail, the controller, and the V router it kind of does the job of you know plumbing and stuff. And this kind of slides kind of shows a like a you know overall picture of like the capabilities we have with respect to service. But the first picture you see like where we have connected two networks using two service functions. So the second uh, the second figure, what you see is like a multiple service chain. So I can say that I want to say send application uh, one. So say Salesforce, I want to go through the first service chain. Something else like a normal internet traffic, I want to send it through. The third one is like a scale out. So when you have like a higher ca traffic throughput or a higher capacity, I can dynamically scale the, you know, like I can have a bigger fan out in terms of the service function. And the last one is like, you know, like a HA, the high availability. You can have active and a standby. If the active goes down, you know, the standby can. Okay, so this is going to be the demo topology. So what you can see is that, so we are actually talking about NFE. So this is also applicable in any enterprise or a data center. But this is more specific than any. So where you can see is that I have a, like a subscriber which could be like an enterprise customer of a service provider and who has bought like a firewall as a service from the service provider. So typically in a managed services environment, so uh, uh, in a, you know, like olden days what like service providers they do is that, so if you order uh, for some, you know, if you buy a service, they kind of ship a, like a, a firewall or a router to your premise and they kind of manage it, manage that. Work. But now with NFP, we move all that to the you know the telco data center. So at the at the you know at the premise at the uh, uh, customer site, you kind of only have a dumb box, which is uh, whose job is only to backhaul the traffic. To all the you know the smart uh, functions, all the smart service uh, functions that kind of run in the data center. So in this figure, you can see that I have a subscriber. And then I have like an internet. So basically these are like, you know, in my case, these are like two XIA ports. So I'm going to send the traffic from the subscriber side. It enters the SDN gateway. So the gateway, SDN gateway is typically like a, it's an entry point into your cloud. So uh, from there, you know, we kind of encapsulate the traffic and we send it to the compute node where you are, you know, the V router, where the, the firewalls are running. Then it kind of gets, it, it kind of, it gets firewalled by the firewall, right? It goes through the firewall, and then it again comes back on a different network. So you see the two blue lines, they are kind of two virtual networks. We call it typically left and right in the, in, in the, in the case of a service chain. And here actually I'm running two firewalls, not one. I'm kind of doing a scale out, you know, so that some flows will be sent to firewall one and, uh, you know, other flows will be sent to firewall. So with this, we can, I think, we can go to the demo. No, it's a video. I think. Can I also see here? Okay. But you may have to pause at times. 
just press the space key. It will stop to explain. Yes. It's five minutes. So, uh, not much, just two kind of, you know, it's because it's fast recorded at a faster. Played from the beginning. Okay, I, I think I am uh, running short of time. I have to, may have to go quickly over this. But we are, uh, you know, we are after the press. Have any questions? Can you make it full screen and just? I think it's here, it's okay here. Yeah. Yeah, if you don't mind, can you start from the beginning? Okay, so this is, uh, you know, this is the setup, uh, what we have. Uh, and if we go to the terminal, uh, so this is the contrail controller. So this is where the, all the controller functions are, are running. Uh, so we are using OpenStack as the orchestrator in, in this case. So you can see the keystone endpoint. And the contrail status, this kind of gives the status of all the contrail you know, functions that are running on the both on the controller and on the V router node. So the neutron net list, I have like bunch of other networks, but you can see, can you pause this one? So you can see the network called as VN100. Uh, and then there is a VN100. Uh, dash right, which is 13.000 slash 8. So these are, you know, these are the left and the right networks for the firewall inside the cloud. So these are the two Nova instances, which kind of corresponds to my two firewalls. So you can also see the networks they are attached to. They are, you know. So what I have created here is that using the two firewall VMs which I have already created. So on the contrail, I have created what is called as a service instance. So you can see here that, uh, so this service instance is called as perf VM1. You can see that the both the VMs are listed here and their interfaces are added. And in the next step, uh, what we create, uh, you know, we create what is called as a network policy. Basically, this is the rule which defines, you know, which are the networks they can, you know, talk with. And in the process, what is the service we are going to apply? So here, if you see, uh, you can go back a little bit and pause. Oh, can you go back a little bit? No, uh, we have to go to the previous uh, web web UI just before this. Oh, it's already back. Okay, I think. You. Okay, yeah, pause, pause here. So you you can see that I have created what is called as a per service policy. I think yes, and the associated networks. So that means uh, which are the networks to which this policy is attached to. Right, any traffic that comes from the VM from the, it will be like subjected to this policy. So I have VN hundred left and right, and then I have defined what are my rules. So I have say I say that protocol any network VN left, and the ports it means any port basically, and the direction you can see the greater than and the lesser than sign, which means it's like bidirectional. It can, come from. and the other side is the VN hundred network right. Again, protocol, any port, any and you, I say that I should send it through service. You can see the last two keywords, services for VM1, which means that any traffic that goes between these two networks, I want to send it through that service instance. Yes, you can continue. So 
this is the gateway, the MX gateway, which I said, which is the entry point. On the MX, the gateway router, we kind of create what is called as a, uh, 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 which is like L3 VPN. So for each uh, kind of a network, we kind of create a corresponding L3 VPN where the routes are, you know, imported uh, from the, you know, what Contrail advertises, it is kind of imported into these routing tables. So, uh, as Aniket already mentioned, so we use BGP uh, to kind of advertise, you know, exchange route between the external world. That is the, in this case, that starts on this MX cloud. So you can see that I am learning the, you know, the uh, the routing, the address prefix of the right network in the left network and also in the, you know, vice versa through BGP. And the next stop, what you see, 5.5.5.232. .5 .5 that is actually the you know the IP address of the hypervisor where the the firewalls are running. Actually, that's the V router node. And whenever uh, the routes are exchanged, uh, the also we kind of dynamically create you know overlay tunnels. So in this case, we are using MPLS over uh, GRE. Uh, so as Raja mentioned, so we like support multiple options, you know, for, uh, you know, encapsulation, VX plan, KLS over GRE and MP. So I'm just going to like, so this, from here we can see that we are starting traffic from both the ports, like which corresponds to the subscriber and the internet. can see all those uh, line items like corresponds to the flows so i'm like not sending one flows i think i'm sending uh, close to 4800 flows uh, between the two ports and we can kind of see the aggregated uh, uh, statistics so if you can see there the tx uh, frame rate and the rx frame rate uh, after that loss percentage. So by the way, it's not loss, it's kind of, you know, there's some latency there. So we can see that it's like 6 million in each direction. So basically this this kind of, this is aggregate of the traffic sent by both ports. So each port is actually sending 3 million in each direction. So it adds up to 6 million in each direction. Uh, I think we're almost on, one minute. So you can see this is just kind of a you know, dashboard. And uh, from here, if we quickly go to the, the this is the V-router, uh, if we jump onto the V-router where actually the VMs are running. So so this kind of gives the flow, so flows, number of flows. So we have like in total 4,800 flows. So that is like a unique uh, kind of common, uh, you know, addresses and the poles. And this uh, screen kind of gives the snapshot of the traffic, uh, you know, the rate. So Sujata, can you just pause here? This is the, this is the end. Oh, I think she, she paused when it kind of just became blank. I think. <laughs> okay, so you can see that at the first line, what you see, physical zero. Uh, you can see the TX and the RX rate. So this is like the real time rate. It's like PPS. Uh, and you can see that it is both is showing as like six six point two million and six point two million. So that is the physical where the you know the packets, the encapsulated packets are entering and leaving the you know supervisor. And then you see at the last four lines you see the uh, tap interfaces which corresponds to the left and the right interface of the two firewalls because we have two firewalls we are like doing in a scale out fashion. So we have four instead of two. And you can see that the 6 million is kind of evenly kind of load balanced between these two firewalls. I think uh, that's the end of the demo. <laughs>